And I think, you know, to, to, to call out authority and speak your truth and fight the system when you've got nothing to lose is relatively easy, really. Anyone can do that because what's the worst that can happen? And I think the real courage is those that have got something to lose but still do it anyway and still fight anyway. And obviously, like I said, I mean, I'm not sure who you're referring to in terms of that podcast, but that they've looked at it and gone, mm, yeah, but I've got all these subscribers and I've got this lifestyle now that I like. And I've got this endorsement with X, Y, and Z, so I'll shut up. Whereas the real courage is those that go, well, I'll lose the endorsement then. Well, I'll lose this then. I'll lose that then because the truth is more important. Gareth, how are you, brother? I'm good, thanks, mate. How are you? Thanks for having me. Gareth, I'm all the more better for listening to your podcast with my good friend, Rich Willett. Uh, WTAF for people that are listening, what the actual... I'm not going to swear in the first five minutes of a YouTube podcast because it gets you demonetized, but I think everyone knows what I was going to say. Um, what a breath of fresh air. Well, that was that was sort of the idea, really. Um, we were filming the walk, um, a series for Iconic up here in Derbyshire, and so um, Rich stayed at my house. And so that night, we'd sort of, you know, I don't know how many miles I'd done that day, twenty odd miles, or whatever. So my legs were aching. I sat there. We had a beer, ordered some takeaway food, and he was just like, "Do you want to just do a podcast or something for a laugh, just like a Facebook Live or something, you know, while we're here?" And um, so I was like, "Yeah, all right." And so we just chatted for like an hour and a half. And it went down really, really well, actually, because it was just two blokes just sort of trying to navigate their way through this sort of clown land um, and trying to almost just put a humorous spin on it. Because I think that's a very English, a very British thing is to if it's dreadful, just laugh, just laugh. You know, we're, we're, that's how we get through stuff. You know, I crashed my car yesterday. Yeah, it was hilarious, isn't it? Because if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And so we just kind of thought we just almost just laugh at stuff and try and flip it. You know, that kind of thing where they've got the power, we haven't. Um, and actually in the end, if you're, it's like that scene from Fight Club where Tyler Durden's getting the hell beaten out of him on the floor by the owner of the of the building and he's just laughing at it. And in the end, the owner gives up and just says, you're mad, just have it. Um, and it's a bit like that really, that we just kind of flip flip it. You know, they're, they're not all powerful, they're ridiculous, which is why we're laughing at them. I'll tell you why I love it, mate, amongst many reasons, other than the fact I, I think you're an absolute legend and, 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 and that goes for your dad as well. Um, is I start, let's do my chronology from 18. So when you're 18, you listen to Radio 1, don't you? And you, you, you think you're cool. <laughs> and then when you get in your 20s or mid, you, you realise Radio 1's a bit shit and it's, it's presented by pricks. So you go to Radio 2 and that's like, hey, it's some old um, some old celebrity presenting now. And they, they talk a slightly left of left of centre or right of what, what, whatever the case may be. And then you realise that's shit. And then you go to Radio 4 and you're like, yes, I found my place in life. There's there's comedy shows. There's this. And then, of course, you get to where we're at, where you become a bit enlightened and you you just see through it all and you see the brainwashing in it all and the bias and the indoctrination and the stifled voices and the complete lack of any sort of critical debate on all the things that are important to us and our families. And so you're like, fuck, I can't even listen to Radio 4 now. <laughs> no, no. So there was there was a bit of a dearth or a, a gap in my life where what what can you do? And then of course podcasting came around, and it's it's rescued my entertainment. And listening to you and Rich chat, it's like a lads show 
for the enlightened. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I, I'm, I'm, the I'm the same. Like I, I did away with radio. And so if I'm driving, I'd have talk sport on. Because, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's football or whatever. So it's not exactly enlightening, but it's also not, you know, I'm not being brainwashed. It's just they're talking about football. And um, but even that's turned now. That's political now. Um, so I kind of I've, I'm yeah I drive in silence now. I mean there was something the other, I was saying to Rich the other day. Like they they were giving it all the give card, the red card, which was amusing me because it's like linking it to football. Um, but the other day I was driving and I I just turned it on. I was like oh, I'll give it a listen. You know see what they're talking about. And it was what was it? Oh God, what was their terminology? It's gonna. It was something like the lockdown station. For the no, that was it. The isolation station for the locked down nation. I say, like, what does that mean? What on earth is that? Just tell me what the score was. God's sake. So I agree with you. Yeah, podcasting is the is the savior, really. And then there's all this taking the knee stuff, isn't it? Oh, mate. When does that I, end? When does that end? I'm a bit um, dodgy on this, Grant, because probably like yourself, I don't watch mainstream media. I just refuse to. I, I think there's two programs I, I I might watch. One of which has just turned a bit shit. Um, now they sacked Ant, Ant Middleton for for daring to like have a voice <laughs> outside of the the narrative. That is, um, that was the SES Who Dares Wins programs. Who who who? Are, I, I love the kind of psychological aspect of these programs. It's not the that I like Channel Four or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm not like down with the kids when it comes to things like BLM, but I, I, I kind of get it. Um, you know, I get the, 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 the influence behind movements like this. I think you've only got to read, read a few books in your life and you'll understand what's going on. It's not, it's not rocket science folks. Um, and so, yeah, this, what is it? The footballers taking a knee because Black Lives Matter. Have, have I got that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest. Fortunately, I'm yet to meet anyone that doesn't think they matter. Um, but the thing with BLM, and, and you always have to specify that when you're talking about Black Lives Matter, you're talking about the organisation. Um, BLM, a lot of people have a problem with. Black Lives Mattering, I hope to think, hardly anyone. I mean, there's always going to be a few idiots, but hopefully no one has a problem with that. Um, but what you have with the players taking a knee is that it, it can't end now because who's going to be the first one to not do it? You're going to be destroyed. You're going to be vilified. So they had a vote here um, where they sort of, you know, asked all the players and all the players said, no, they want to keep doing it. It's like, yeah, of course they did. Because imagine the ones that go, well, I don't want to do it anymore. And so a few black players have come out um, I, I support Derby County and, and we've got one lad who, who doesn't take a knee. He stands up and there's a guy at Nottingham Forest as well. Obviously, they're big rivals of ours, but he's the same. And he's outspoken because he doesn't agree with the politics of BLM. Um, and so he doesn't take a knee, but all the other lads around him do. So I, I, I don't know when it ends, to be honest. It's, it's, it's one of those things. No one, wants to, no one wants to be the one to go, I'm not doing it, and then get the absolute <clears throat> barrage of, of woke Twitter. Yeah, well, I do, because when, they, again, if you've anyone that, that's read 1984 knows about the two minutes of hate where the population have become so fractured and indoctrinated and scared that they go outside and they have to hate, hate the, the uh, enemies for two minutes. And it's, ah, it's literally like this. If, if people are wondering, what have I gone mad? And of it course, just, it sounds that. like Good Morning Britain, that does. <laughs> That's all that sounds what, like. What it sounds like, Gareth, is the bloody two-minute clap, isn't it? Oh, mate, don't, and, don't and even the, get me started and, on that. And, and the standing on one knee, or the, the going down on one knee, it's these public um, displays of, of meaningless virtue signalling fucking nonsense that, that obviously not just detract from the real issues, but... but you know, they, they're not helpful. <laughs> they're not helpful, are they? No, they don't do anything. That's the thing. I, I have that. When I look at BLM, for, for instance, for as an organisation, if you look at who funds them, ask the question, why are they funding them? Because the people that fund them aren't nice people. They're not virtuous people. A Coca-Cola. 
you know, they're not nice people that are funneling money into them. So why are they doing it? You know, and that's a you know a rabbit hole that people will either want to or not want to get into. But the same with the with the clapping for the NHS. For me, that was like in hindsight, it was almost like that was to create and and a, a, a very real thing in people's lives of this massive problem that we had in this country because on the face of it in the street you weren't seeing anything if you turn the news off it didn't exist anymore and i still stand by that now if, if you hadn't had a tv for the last 12 months you wouldn't know anything was happening because it's it's not hitting people in the way like they compare it to the blitz and it's like no nah, i think if the blitz was happening i'd know a bomb was landing but so it was almost like the clap for carers thing was a way of just bringing that out of, oh, why is everyone clapping? Oh, that's why. And it's kind of just making sure that it's just prodding people going, look, there's a big problem. Stay in your house, stay in your house, stay in your house. But people got sick of it. Like we had neighbours across the road, proper pots and pans job. They were like just smashing pots and pans, not happy with clapping. And the lady was always craning her neck as well to see who else was out so she could, you know, judge them if they weren't, which is, I dread to think what she must have been saying about us because we weren't out. But um. But even on the second one, when they tried to bring down, bring bring back the clap for carers, even she didn't come out. So I think people are sick of it, you know, to be honest. Although one yeah. good thing about it, the first time it happened, I forgot that it was even happening and I didn't care anyway. But I was walking out the house at that particular sort of couple of minutes. And because it was like during um, sort of the start of the summer, my my little one walked out. She's only two. And she thought everyone was clapping for her. And that still makes me laugh. So I was stood in my doorway and she was in our little front porch area, just like looking around, smiling, like, yeah, yeah, everyone's clapping for me. <laughs> no, they're not, but they may as well be. Yeah, it must be um, tough for all those NHS workers that have come off a late shift or a night shift and they're, they're on the way around their drug dealer's house to get a, ra- a rock a crack and suddenly everyone starts... <laughs> it's like, fuck off. <laughs> I want some private life. Exactly. Yeah. How about a pay rise now? We'll just clap for you. All right. Cheers. Yeah. That'll help. That'll help. I was out there booing, but I got told I wasn't allowed to do that. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? I just made a point of not even doing it, not even going out. But I would occasionally sort of curtain twitch just to see the pots and pans lady craning her neck because it was making me laugh. Although I did come up with the idea because I was doing these um, 10Ks throughout the first lockdown. And I was saying to people, rather than donate money to stuff, I'll tell you what I'll do let's have a little bit of 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 kind of self-responsibility which no one has anymore everyone you know or oh, you'd be responsible for me but i thought i'll be responsible so what i'm responsible for is i'm going to do seven 10ks in seven days and your responsibility is that you're going to go next time you go shopping you're going to chuck some food in the food bank that, that you have kind of at the front of most of these supermarkets so i'm not going to ask you for the money so i can go out and spend it on the food bank i'm going to trust you to take responsibility that you're going to do it and so we did that anyway and so for one of the later runs, like my legs were aching. And, and so what I was trying to do was if I did one in the morning, you know, then the next day I'd probably do it in the afternoon. So I'd buy myself like a day and a half recovery or whatever. And then I decided, I was like, do you know what I'm going to do? Because I was doing them around about 55 minutes. I was like, I'm going to go out about five past eight, uh, sorry, five past seven in the evening, right? And I'm going to try and time it so that when I come back down my street, I come back down the street at the point everyone stood out clapping. So it'd be like, I've come, and, and I just had this idea of just running down the street with my arms out like that, like I, like I was on the finishing straight. And that really ch- chuckled me for a while to do that. Yeah. Wind them up, why not? A thing that I think is well, Gareth, I don't know if you've had any thoughts on this, but like, as I, as I mentioned, other than those two programmes, I, I don't watch mainstream media. And I noticed that all these rules, uh, you know, regular, and they're not laws, are they? They're just like, no. they're just sort of made up regulations that we're all expected to follow. And yet they only come through the mainstream media channels. So basically BBC News and Channel 4 News and ITV, right? Nothing's actually come through my door on like a, a proper legal basis to say, right, Mr. Thrall, you are subject to these conditions. You need to follow, um, you know, these rules for the welfare and the, n- n- nothing that. We- so my question That's is... That's actually a really good point. That's a really good point. I've never even thought about that. Well, I don't watch mainstream media, Gareth. So when I go in the shop and someone goes, where's your mask? I'm like, what are you on about? Oh, you got to wear it because of this 
thing. And I'm like, what thing? It's all on the news. I don't watch the news. <laughs> I go on the internet, right? Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious, if that's the right word. Or, um, But it just does make me think, what? So is the BBC now telling us how to live our lives? How, how, how does that work? Because they don't like me and they certainly don't like my family. What, what, why, why would I follow what, what, why would I follow what they say? Well, that's it. But they're, they're, they're just a propaganda arm of government, aren't they? BBC and, and, you know, Sky News, they're all, they're all the same, really. But it's actually a really good point. You know, if you don't have a, a TV and you don't watch TV, I mean, I don't watch live TV. I might watch something like a, like a documentary or a film that's on sort of Netflix or now TV or whatever, but I don't, I don't watch telly. I don't, I don't watch mainstream media. I'm like you, I see little bits and bobs online but i don't i don't actively watch it so if you're an older person that just says you know i just like reading books i don't watch tv then you wouldn't even know about this and again that comes back to the fact that when they compare it well this is the biggest challenge since world war ii but you knew world war ii was going on even if you didn't have a telly or a wireless or anything you would still go shit what's that what coventry's on fire oh man you'd know about it Whereas if you didn't have them, if you don't have the media now, you, you honestly wouldn't know. Like I live in a village, a couple of thousand people. Nope, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Yes. Gareth, you're, you're remarkably well balanced, if I may say so, considering the, the, the shit you must have gone through going, growing up. Um, is that something you've had to work on? By that, folks, I'm I, I, I'm I'm referring to David going through the public humiliation and and just the the worst side of not just human nature but British British thuggish culture as it can be. Um, was how how did you get your head around that? If if and again, I you don't have to answer anything you don't want to. It's it no, no. I, I I'll be honest. I went there to come back. So um, in my school years, I was a bit you know a bit sort of off the rails and whatever, and, and got expelled and things like that. And then um, when I became into my late teens, I was in punk bands, and so I lived in a tour bus for like five years basically, and just drank and woke up on benches. In, in places and then I started playing beach soccer um I, I got basically I was in the pub obviously and I had played football back in the day I played over at Portsmouth Football Club when I was living on the Isle of Wight and so there was a beach soccer tournament that was taking place the next day and these lads had gone here yeah, mate you used to play in gold didn't you and I was like yeah and freaking million years ago why and they said um well we need a goalie for this game tomorrow and I was like okay yeah fine I'll do it I'd had enough beers to agree to it anyway next day totally forgot that I'd agreed to it. And my sister phoned me and was like, you're, you're supposed to be playing beach soccer today, aren't you? Because oh, we're going to come down. I was like, you are. And, um, and so anyway, I went and I turned up and I played this match. I never played beach soccer before. Um, and had a bit of a worldie really. And then um, ended up playing for this team a few times. And it was a bit of a laugh. And then I got a phone call probably about a month later saying, um, can, can you be in Marseille? Like, when can you be in Marseille? So my response was obviously like, well, who's paying? And I'll decide if I can be in Marseille or not. Why? And basically what had happened is the England squad were, were there playing World Cup qualifiers and someone had knocked over a coffee machine in the foyer of this hotel. And it basically severed the, well, all but severed the big toe of, of the substitute goalie, right? So his toes hanging off. So they didn't have a goalie. They've obviously phoned around all these other goalies that play in this league. And, you know, I can't get out of work that short notice. Can't do this, can't do that. So it's come to me. And obviously at that time I was playing in bands, so I could kind of do what I wanted when I wanted really. So I agreed and I flew out to Marseille, sat on the bench against France, didn't get a kick, didn't expect to, to be honest, I was just there for the sunshine. So I sat there and then the next game was against um, Greece and um, the goalie, who was the first choice goalie, had suffered with vertigo. I mean, there must have been the most blooming injury prone team in the world. Anyway, he suffered from vertigo. So he played the first period. So it's nil nil, there's three periods of 20 minutes in beat soccer. He's, um, he's not right when he comes off the first period. And he's like, so they, obviously the manager's turned to me. He's like, you're going to have to go in. And obviously my ass has fallen out. I was like, I've just, you know, this, it's live on Eurosport. I'm just here for a laugh. And I went in. Anyway, I saved a penalty and we won 4-0. And, um, and then that was it. And so when I came back from France after that, they were starting to prepare for this tour of South Africa, which was in about five months. And so I just thought, 
do you know what? Shawshank Redemption, get busy living, get busy dying. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my head down and I'm going to make sure I go to South Africa. And so I did. And that sort of saved me a bit because it got me off the booze. It got me fit. I mean, not that I was an alcoholic, but I was you know, drinking too much, but it got me fit and gave me a bit of focus. And then I went to South Africa and, and played out there and then I ended up in playing in Israel and Azerbaijan and Norway and all these like random countries that you'd never normally go to. Um, and that sort of focused me a bit. And then that was that. And then, um, yeah, that's me, basically. But, I, but I, I became grounded as a result of losing the plot, basically, rather than just being able to deal with everything. You know. How old were you, Gareth, when your dad was on on Wogan? I know he's on there twice. But... Um, eight, maybe eight o'clock. Uh, eight o'clock. Um, eight years old. I'm trying to think. The second one. The second one was years later, wasn't it? Um, yeah, they were both it, fucking yeah. fiasco, so weren't they? Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was funny. It was weird though, because like I went from him being like whenever you went around places. Obviously, this days before camera phones and whatever. But whenever you went out people would stop him in the street and they'd want an autograph, they want to shake his hand or whatever. And it went from that to people shouting at him in the street and laughing and pointing in as a kid in, in the space of about 25 minutes. So it was very odd, I must admit, as a kid. It was just like, why is everyone being a dick? Um, so that was strange, yeah. But then, but what it also, it's one of those things, you know, when people say, I don't care what people think. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Um, but what it did is it, I, I don't think I'd have ever got onto a stage as a musician. I don't think I'd have ever probably gone out and played beach soccer all over the world and done all these things f almost fearlessly if if I hadn't have had all that shit really. Mm. So, and it's the same now. Like I'll say what I want. If I believe something to be true, I'll say it. And obviously you get loads of shit back for it. And, and I, I just sort of just laugh. And I'd end up getting messages quite a lot of people that I used to go to school with and whatever. They're just like, mate, I wish I could say the stuff you say. Cause I think it as well, but I'll just get, you know, mother-in-law or employer or guys across the road or whatever. So I don't bother saying it. Whereas I'm just like, well, I've been battered so much with it that I'll say what I want. Thanks. Mm. It's quite liberating to be honest. Yes. Um, well, we've all been through it to, I mean, well, anyone that's enlightened see, that seems to have gone through some shit in their life. You know, that we were asking the question the other day, how come, how come there's those of us that we can just see what's going on? We understand it. it. It's just so obvious. And other people, it's almost like, how can I share the same planet with you? We, we literally, you literally live in a matrix and I don't. I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect or anything, but I don't live in that world. When I yeah. see the BBC News, like the fear banner go, it's like fear, be careful, watch it, but don't you know, don't let this kind of affect you in any, in, in any way. And then of course you've got matey next door. They believe it's all true. Oh, and they mate, literally yeah. do not know any difference. And yeah, it is strange. If I hear be safe one more time as well, you know, even if you just go to the shop, just be safe. Yeah. I don't want to be safe. I want to be alive. There's a difference. Yeah. I want to be dead, believe it or not. I don't mean that suicidally. I mean, if it's my time, it's my fucking time. We've, hopefully it won't be too soon, but, you know, there's a reason that humanity's evolved over millions of years, well, bi billions of years, if you go back to the swamp. And there's a reason why certain people will die at a specific time. It's for the greater benefit of the species, isn't it? It's... It, it, it's um, so the yeah. notion that, like, I might die, well, what's the worst can happen? Well, I'm carbon molecules, so I can't go anywhere, can I? I'm just going to reform as another part of this beautiful universe. And, and sadly, whether I like it or not, whether anyone likes it, we're here to eternity. We can't actually, you know, we, I, think, I think your dad speaks really well on this. And I think he... I think Bill Hicks also said a similar thing, this that we're carbon molecules vibrating at a certain frequency and we're, we're the universe experiencing itself in, in these forms. So you're me, I'm you, and we're actually also a rock. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It is quite strange to me, actually, that the only thing, the only certainty in a world of uncertainty is death. Uh, it's, the, yeah, it's the one thing that no one can accept. It, 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 I mean, I accept it. I'll go when it's my time to go, and I'm, I'm fine with that. The idea of, 
you know, leaving my kids, you know, at a very young age is sad and I don't want that to happen. But then at the same time, the idea of me living forever ever sounds like bloody torture, to be honest. I, I'll, you know, I'll go when I'm meant to go and I'll go and explore the rest of whatever there is to explore for sure. You know, yeah. um, I must admit, like you said, you're, you're totally right as well. You're saying like, how hey, you kind of step out of this matrix and you're looking at people and who, who, are, who are just not seeing stuff. And I, I do find it strange. Like, so early, early doors, like you could have these theories or these conspiracies or these things where people just don't want to accept them and they can't see them. And I could almost accept that in a certain way. Cause it's like, okay, yeah, you're not ready yet. That's, that's fine. You're not ready yet. You're not ready to see that. Yet with this kind of stuff that's going on now, like I did an interview ages ago with a guy called Sterling Simpson, who's a lung specialist. And he was saying that the government always tells you, uh, they always tell you, um, it's just they know you're too stupid, too blind, too ignorant, too lazy to see it. So even, even when it comes to, to carcinogenic stuff in food, they don't sneak it into food. They put it on the label. The fact that that big long word there, you you could just put that into Google and, it, and you could find out whether it's dangerous or not. You just don't bother. You just get it down your neck. And it's the same with all of this stuff. So you've got, obviously, Fauci said the stuff about the PCR test, the fact that above 35 cycles, it's a scam. Yet the NHS is telling you it's using 45 cycles. So they're telling you these things, but they know that, you know, people aren't going to do anything about it. And that's what I find strange is that you present facts to people and, and you use their data. And so you use government data. So like today, I've shared a couple of things from the UK government website where they've done reports. Um, one is, is on Pfizer and it's from the 9th of December to the 14th of February. And one is for AstraZeneca and it's from the 4th of January to the 14th of February. And these are the adverse effects. Now this is on the government website. So this isn't like, you know, John across the road has been doing some research and he's put it in a PowerPoint. So on the government website right there, and it's telling you all the adverse reactions and deaths. And so Pfizer's 52 pages, 52 pages of adverse reactions, about 77,000 different adverse reactions and 197 deaths, right, in that short period of time. Um, AstraZeneca is 111,000 adverse reactions, 205 deaths in that short period of time. Now you show those facts to people, you go, that's on the government website, look at that. And they're, they're telling you, you can't go to the pub unless you have that. That's madness, isn't it? Oh, anti-vaxxer, sick and tired people, anti-vaxxers, they're putting people's life at risk. And you're just like, I don't know what to tell you, mate. It's there, it's on. It's, it's their own figures, mm. but, but people don't want to see it. And that is very frustrating. I have to say that is like banging me head on this. Yeah, gosh, we probably can't say, there's nothing more to say on this because you either see it or you don't. I've got people like on my Instagram posting the little certificate that they give you as if it's some sort of fucking trophy. Oh, mate, don't. Right? And if you want to talk about selfishness, it's not the ones that are standing clear of all this nonsense. We're, we're, the, we're the ones putting our freaking necks on the line because we love humanity and we, we, we support the, 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 let's call it the species. It, it's the other way around. It's you, you little scared people that want to protect your own self. Whereas like was Gareth and I said, when it's your time, you're gone when you're gone, it's your time. It's just, just accept it. You know, it's that to me is selfish because what you're doing is saying, I want to go around Mother Nature or God or universal spirit or whatever your chosen, um, you know, me, uh, chosen word is. I want to circumvent that and I want to cheat nature and make sure I'm still here. And it's. Oh, yes. Anyway. Just if we can just this one thing I've always wanted to ask your dad if I got the chance to to podcast or or speak to him was that first Wogan show was your dad becoming enlightened, Gareth, or would you say he was unwell? I don't mean like he was off the mark unwell. I mean that. It, like how did his enlightenment come around 
I, th- I think, to be honest, what he would say, uh, I've heard him say it before, like it was like um, he basically came into so much information so quickly that it was basically like he describes it as someone just smashing the keys on a computer. Yeah. And in the end, the computer just freezes and it's trying to process it. And after a while, the, the little spinning icon goes and everything shows itself. But I think the point he went on, Wogan, was at that point where he was basically just trying to compute stuff. Um, but then at the same time, like I've seen that interview back and, you know, the tracksuit's pretty dreadful. But when they say, you know, he said he was the son of God. No, he didn't. He actually didn't say that. He said that we were all sons of the Godhead. Now, I don't see that as being so out there. What you're basically saying is that we're all brothers and sisters of the same force. You know, we're all one another. Yeah. Now, I, I, I find that strange that people would find that kooky to kind of think that that's the way it is. I mean, I think that's just most people think that, that we're all, whoever put us here, whatever put us here, we're all one, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't put here by him and he wasn't put here by her. It was like, we're all here together. So I don't, yeah, that whole yeah, son of God well, thing I mean, was weird for me. That's what the scriptures say anyway, isn't it? We're all born in God's image or, or to, to me, that's just a, a way of saying, like I say, we're all part of the universe. It's not, yeah, it's not out there, is it? No, that's the thing. And most of the people that would be taking the mic would be sat singing hymns in midnight mass. Do you know what I mean? And so it's like, well, which is it? Is it nonsense or is it not? You know, although one funny story, actually. So around about that time, we'd gone out for the day um, on the Isle of Wight just as a family. And we went to a place called Godza and it's lovely. Loads of tea rooms. They've got a model village. I'm a bit of a train geek. So I'd love the model village, all the trains and stuff like that. And we're taking a walk to the top of the hill and there's this really beautiful little church, right? And this was when all this stuff was going around about, you know, Jesus, blah, 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 blah. And so we looked around the church and all of a sudden there's loads of people there, tourists, obviously a big tourist place. And all of a sudden the church caught fire, right? And I don't know how it happened, but it went up and, you know, it didn't burn it down, but part of the roof went up and whatever. And I just remember like some of the other tourists like looking like, what is going on? Like he's here, suddenly the church is on fire. This is a bit weird. And you knew, like, for a split second, people were starting to doubt. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's happening? What's, what, you know, has he brought some, like, second coming thing and the, the church has gone up? I think about that sometimes. It makes me chuckle. The thing I like is I sort of... I sort of got my epiphany, which is what sent me down what I would call the pathway of enlightenment right and i got that after my chronic drug addiction when i finally like woke up one day and it was oh my god right chris enough is a fuck enough now mate you know this this is getting this is not working anymore right but that was 1998 i think and it wasn't until 2000 and Five, 2006 that I had a, a lecturer at uni I was studying for my youth work degree and he said guys have you seen these videos that are coming up online and this was the early days and I, like, I had my first pc and it was that 386 pentium 386 <laughs> be so wouldn't even work now it'd be so slow and um he said yeah apparently and Gareth, I just refer to it as what happened in New, New York and Washington 20 years ago. I think everyone knows what we're talking I don't say the number yeah. for ob- obvious reasons. Um, but he said, people are saying that what was supposed to have hit the Pentagon, you know, that wasn't how it was, right? So I went home and I, I, I found the video he's referring to, or one of them, and it was... Oh, my God. It was just a further moment of enlightenment. But I'd say that was the one that put me on the this side of the fence as opposed to like being in it's the one that got finally like really got me out of the matrix. But I remember back then, if anybody on social media, media, media social media mentioned David, it would be like the 99 attack the one right fucking using the you know the terms that people you all this all the cia invented slurs right 
Now, it's the other way around. The one person that uses the conspiracy, they get attacked by the 99. Or the one person that slags your dad off, suddenly it's like, oi, do you, you know, do you realise all of what he said is coming true? And this kind of thing. And I just want to say I'm pleased to have seen that in my lifetime. Um, it's yeah, lot- I think, I think um, New York and Washington red-pilled a lot of people. A lot of people. Because that story is so, like the official narrative is so ridiculous that even those that would go, oh, bloody lizard, moon landing, flat earth, whatever, even they with, with that would be... I mean, I know a few people that believe the complete official narrative, but they'd believe, you know, the official narrative of everything because that's who they are. But most people, I think, have at, at least some very, very big questions about that whole thing. Yes. Yes, they do. I'm just trying to think of this anything I can say for people that are listening that are kind of curious, but um, there was a a film that came out at the time. In fact, I went to meet the last guy to get out of the buildings. Everyone knows the buildings I'm on about. The last guy to get out alive. He's been on my podcast, actually, um, Willie. Um, And round about that time, you had a lot of scholars writing about this before it all got censored and brushed under the carpet. And time, time has kind of brushed it under the carpet a bit. Um, but there was that brilliant film again I won't say the numbers but it's the numbers uh, and then it was loose and then it was change (laughs) spread those words apart so the computers don't the software doesn't get us but and it I'd say to anyone listening if you can find that film that I just said I'll try and put a link to it below but it's hard to find now It it was sort of irrefutable evidence really that the official narrative wasn't it there was so many holes in it yeah there's a lot of people still still fighting um like the architects for truth and stuff like that that are still really really fighting um there's firefighters for truth as well there's there's lots and the but 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 this is the world we live in now where the media just just turns a blind eye to stuff so you know, I mean, RT says question everything. I don't believe they question everything. I think they, they question more than a lot, but they don't question everything. But but they they published some stuff on it about the fact that um, the other building, which didn't yeah. get hit but collapsed anyway, was a controlled demolition, um, which of course it was. It wasn't hit by anything. I have no reason to fall down. Um, but that should have been, I mean, that should have been lead story. You know, that should have been after the first bong on the 10 o'clock news my God, this was a controlled demolition. Because then that asked the, the question, like buildings don't have, they don't have explosives in them at all times. So you can just go, just pull it, yeah, pull it. Like it takes months to, to rig those buildings in the same way that, you know, if, if a, a, an ice hockey stadium or a football stadium or a theater or whatever has been condemned or a big tower block, you know, they, they have to, do all the charges and all that sort of stuff. And it takes months to do it. And then everyone turns up and watches and they press the button and it collapses and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. This, this did that anyway. So the question would then be, why is, why has it got explosives in it? And I think that's, you know, that's not a tinfoil hat question. That's a legitimate question. Why has it got explosives in it? Well, it's even more legit, mate, because the university of Fairbanks, Alaska were commissioned by the architects people to do an independent study, I hint independent, it's a university, right? It's a prestigious university in America. And their finding was like, the NIST, what's it? The National Institute of Science and Technology, like the model that they brought out to just fucking con everyone with, just was farcical. It was, there's absolutely no way that these pillars started to to destroy themselves for, you know, because of, wasn't even jet fuel because like you said no 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 vehicle hit those those buildings it, 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 they blamed it on there was a generator in the basement or something like this yeah it was office fires wasn't it oh oh it's paper in the bin it's so it's crazy that we've been led or, or that so many people probably still believe that right 
And the University of Fairbanks, Alaska brought out this report and said, no, that's all nonsense. It, it's physical impossibility. Yeah. Basically, and, and, and the fact that the BBC announced that it'd gone. And when she's announcing it's gone, it's behind her. There. It ain't gone yet. There. So, yeah. so you know, there's so many questions. Hmm. And it's, yeah, that's why I think it red-pilled so many people because there's so many obvious things about it that are like, well, hang on, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know? Well, I think we've said enough, mate, to, to, I think a good part of having these kind of chats isn't to try to convince people or turn people, because I don't know if you can actually do that, but dropping the odd, you know, whatever you call it, seed isn't a bad thing. But we're also supporting all those people out there that have come to realise this and that are looking for logical, rational, like-minded figures to go, yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. You know, it's the same when I go out in public and I think people will know what I'm on about if I say I don't do a certain thing that everyone or the majority seems to be doing when I say, for example, go in a supermarket. And a big part of the reason, even though I'm just as afraid of confrontation, getting attacked in a is, is all of anyone watching this, I'm just as afraid as you but my moral principles will not let me bow down to that fear, right? And one of the other factors is, I know there'll be people in that super looking at me going, this guy's a fucking legend. Look, he's, he's, he's doing the right thing. I, I, I you know, I, I should be doing what he's doing, but I'm just too afraid. And, and it's just showing people that, no, it's okay to, to, to stand up for what is right. Um, it's our bloody children for crying out loud. Yeah, that that's the bit that gets me. That's the bit that gets me. Um, the but connection I, I, of fucking child abusers. It's just so wrong. But you can see the world's run by child abusers, though, because of because of how it's being normalised. You know, if you if you lived in a sane world, you, you, this kind of whole that kind of stuff for kids, they would that would that would be off limits. Um, you know, they're, they're doing, um, I think it's Johnson and Johnson. So um, how much of Johnson and Johnson paid out because their talcum powder was giving people cancer for crying out loud. They're now, um, having trials on kids. Mm. Who's, who's, who's agreeing for their child to be in a trial because they ain't a parent like that's insanity. Um, and, but I agree with you. I, I don't preach i don't see the point in preaching because it's kind of like don't listen to the mainstream media listen to me well i'm just as bad then but what i do is exactly the same as you is this well this is how i'm going to live my life this is what i do and here's a few little seeds of stuff of why i do that and why i believe that and then you go away and you do research and you decide whether i'm an idiot or whether you agree with me and that's how it should be and that's why i think it's important that we that we do these things and i know certain people within the alternative which i won't name but preach a lot you know don't do this don't wear a you know all this, but they do it but they do it mm. so you go well how does that work you want me to do something but you're not willing to do it you know and that's where you get peter hitchens i mean that's just staggering to me i don't know if you've seen that story with him enlighten us mate well basically he's he's you know obviously been supposedly fighting against this since the beginning and then he gets his phone call saying you know you're going to come in for a jab and he goes and gets it now I don't give a toss whether he's doing that, that you do, you, you are, you fill your boots, mate. If you want to get it, I, I, I think I should be free to not have it. And you should be free to have it. If you want it, you go do you, hun. So my issue with him isn't because of that. It was then that he wrote a whole article about the fact that he'd had to do it because we've been defeated. We've lost. So, okay. So you've not even waited for passports to come out and be commissioned and be put out because then what you could do, Peter, is you go, oh, I need a passport and I don't have one. I want to go and see my family. Oh, OK, I'll reluctantly do it. Right. You've not even done that, Peter. You've you've got the phone call and you've just done it immediately. And then written a big article telling everyone that we've lost and urging other people to give in and do it. Like, that's why I have a problem with that. And, and the backlash on him has been huge. And I'll be honest, I think he's finished. Um, it's it's yeah. the same. Can I just say, I thought Peter Hitchin was dead. We're that's, talking his, to... that's his brother, Christopher. He died. Oh, apologies to, to friends and family and fans listening. I didn't mean to be rude. Um, yeah, but it, that's very similar to when somebody asked Chomsky. 
I'm forgetting his surname. What is it? Norm. Yeah, no, Norm. Sorry, I didn't mean to sound disrespectful, but someone asked Norm Chomsky, "What about building?" <clears throat> he went, "Oh well, you know what it is. I'm not a scientist, so I'm not positioned to cut." It's <laughs> fucking what you comment on every other thing in history, but this what and. <laughs> He's not the only one, though. Assange skirts around 9-11 as well. Similar to when certain, you know, again, I'm not into besmirching people. It's not what I do, but I just, we need to talk to highlight examples. But it's when certain podcasters who, you know, made a career out of highlighting the ridiculousness of certain narratives that are just accepted in society. Um, you know, I don't even want to say but and then suddenly they just shut up one day and it's like hang on oh no i didn't say that oh yeah well i said it but what i meant it, it's like no dude you didn't you like we all followed you because you were highlighting this bullshit and now that you've got your one million subscribers and your your new contract for so and so and this tv contract and this avid blah 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 etc suddenly like you've you've turned on us and you've literally you know you were these people could be such strong voices i kind of get it i think if norm was to talk out and tell the truth what he knows about you know that event that we discussed yeah probably he would be executed with <laughs> i don't i don't know or he'd be besmirched or but isn't it better to go out fighting than to live as a coward. I, I agree. You know, I agree. I'd say put Bernie Sanders in that list as well. Um, like yeah. when he when he endorsed Hillary, you know, I know it's all freaking pantomime anyway, but the fact that he endorsed Hillary after she'd obviously he'd been cheated out of the nomination, you know, that that was insane. Um, and I think, you know, to 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 call out authority and speak your truth and fight the system when you've got nothing to lose is relatively easy, really. Anyone can do that, because what's the worst that can happen? And I think the real courage is those that have got something to lose, but still do it anyway and still fight anyway. And obviously, like you said, I mean, I'm not sure who you're referring to in terms of that podcast, but that they've looked at it and gone, oh, yeah, but I've got all these subscribers and I've got this lifestyle now that I like and I've got this endorsement with X, Y, and Z, so I'll shut up. Whereas the real courage is those that go, well, I'll lose the endorsement then. Well, I'll lose this then. I'll lose that then because the truth is more important. They're, they're the ones that I think will be left standing at the end. I honestly believe that. And I think like with Pete Hitchens, I, I described this to, um, to a couple of people I was talking to on Twitter where I was saying basically, because I believe wholeheartedly we're going to win this, that Pete Hitchens will basically be the Pete best of the resistance. In, in, in the, you know, he was there and then he just bailed out and then we won in the same way that, you know, the Beatles became successful. And um, I honestly believe that. Mm. And I feel sorry for him in a way. Oh, God. Yes. Anyway, enough doom and gloom. Tell us about your music, Gareth, because I was listening to it before the podcast. Um I miss it, actually. I miss it because I've not been gigging anywhere. Yeah. Um, what, what I did at the start of the first lockdown is a lot of people were doing these online streams. And so I did a couple because I think, you know, try everything twice. And I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Because it was like this. I mean, I'm chatting to you. I can see the whites of your eyes when we're talking. So we're having a conversation, even though it's over the internet. But with the gigs, with those live streams, you can't see anyone. So all I could see was myself. So I'm there playing guitar to myself. And like you'd have the odd like or the odd heart or the odd thing will appear here and there, but you can't see anyone. And then you finish a song and it's silence, obviously, because there's no applause. There's no interaction between you and the audience, which for me is the whole point of performing. So I hated it. So I stopped doing that. But hopefully, you know. Plus, plus by doing all this Zoom shit and, and changing your, your spare bedroom into your new office, you know, where your four-year-old comes running in in 10 times a day and he's listening to you making phone calls about adult stuff. Like my partner is a, a drug worker, right? Works with some of the real nasty cases and involving children and all this kind of stuff. Like, and, and yet it, I've got to be careful what I say because I don't play the narrative, Gareth, at, at all, right? So we don't do what everyone else does. 
we do what what is right to a point you know we have our we we, we have our differences but like I don't want my little lad running in and uh, I wouldn't want him listening to my partner's work because a she's supposed to be at work she's supposed to be concentrating on her work he's supposed to be at school or whatever well he is at school um but if he was home doing what all the other kids are having to do uh he shouldn't he he needs attention he needs his mother and a father that are not going right son just just give us two i've just got to make one more phone call about you know a methadone prescription it's so i got slightly off track there but what my point is is by trying to do these things or by buying into this shit you're just supporting this whole home cocoon dehumanization you know de decommunitizing if that's even a word um I'm guilty. I mean, I do the Zoom podcast. I will say that this is what I've always done. I did this before all this stuff happened. That's different, um, though. If you're talking to people all over the place, I mean, whereabouts are you? I'm in the southwest, so down on the coast. Yeah, so you're you're 250 miles from me. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I still get people like, oh, Chris, I want to do it in person, right? They want me on their podcast. I'm like, dude, you live in Liverpool. Do you expect me to seriously take a day off to drive up there and do a podcast, then get a hotel for 150 quid for the evening, then spend half the next day driving home, then have to put my feet up because obviously I'm tired from driving and I, that's like two days off my work. Um, and you want me to do that to come and do a, no disrespect, but a free podcast and it's going to get 300 views on YouTube. It, it, it's a, ah, Sorry, yeah, I, I, not worth it. I I prefer the personal thing, but for for the travel reasons, it it just doesn't work out. No, of course not. But you but you're right though. Like this is so. I've got a friend who's sorting our kitchen out for us because the kitchen's an absolute mess. Like we've lived in the house a couple of years, and we've basically you know done most of it up ourselves. Brought the odd person in to do bits and bobs that are sort of beyond our our skills. So I've got a mate sorting the kitchen and doing bits and bobs. And he, he was saying to me that the amount of um, like conversions he's doing into pubs. So like people turning their garage into a bar or turning the garden shed into a bar, that that sort of thing's gone through the roof. And it's like, because no, no one can go to the pub anymore. And, and so what's going to happen is obviously if I spend five grand having my conservatory or my garage turned into this wicked pub, as soon as the pub's open, I'm not going to go, well, bugger that then. I'm off down the dog and duck you're going to end up staying in your pub because you spent all the money on it. And that's what will happen. You know, people are, are, are creating their homes into those, into those things. And it is like, you, everyone's just freaking under house arrest. That's your music, mate. So I'm not being r r rude. Um, I was listening to Souls of Kevlar this morning. And it oh, yeah. Only, only takes a day to forget. Very good voice you've got, mate. Thanks, mate. They're, um, I was supposed to be recording in Scotland, those tracks, um, in the summer, like full band. But um, the great Nick Tater went, went full mental, didn't she? So that wasn't happening. So in the end, I went down to the Isle of Wight for Christmas, to see my family. And um, I've got a mate that runs a studio there. So I just recorded them live. I just figured, like, I've written them and I wrote them throughout lockdown. So it was a case of let's just record them and so they don't get forgotten, basically. But they're just, yeah, just live me with an acoustic guitar can people buy your music garage so, so we can support you a bit is there a... yeah so if you go to uh one set Matt, one set we've got john O'Groats to land's end yeah sorry for folks watching my wow. um, my avatar came came up instead of my beautiful face and um it gives me a chance to show off to gareth that i ran the length of the uk that's unbelievable, mate. Ultra marathon a day for 37 days, sleeping at the side of the road, basically being an absolute hero. Um, and I got lots of women because of it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. They, yeah. All, they all fancied me. How can you resist, mate? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, the, the smell that was coming off me by the time I got to Land's End, you could... 
even the my fellow Marines were going, "Fucking Chris, you stink." <laughs> your feet, your feet must have been a mess, were they? Um, I basically got through one heel. The whole of one heel came off, and then you you go again, right? It it it. it I put some tape over it, and it heals up a bit. And you, no, it was the fact that I got halfway down the country. I got to round about um, Wigan sort of area, and. I fractured my right leg. I got shit, what we call shin splint in, in the military. So it's basically a stress fracture going around my, my calf. And, oh, mate, it become freaking agony. Absolute agony to the point I couldn't even walk, let alone run. And then I had sat down on a grass bank and thought, right, how can I, I'm not stopping, but I can't run. So that was kind of not helpful, really. Um, and I looked to my left and there was a fucking off license. <laughs> so I went and said, can I have a bottle of rum, please? <laughs> and I bought a, a little bottle of rum and I just took a massive, massive swig. I will say I've taken a painkiller. For friends listening, please don't do this. It's fucking really dangerous. You can die. It's the biggest cause of overdoses. People mixing alcohol with, with uh, opiate medication or whatever it might be. But I've taken a... a ibuprofen or something and and off the back of that I was like oh I feel all right now <laughs> and that broken leg mysteriously so every morning I just had a tot of rum and I was able to able to finish um but yes seriously impressive though mate that's that's like top end yeah well, well I didn't set out to impress Gareth it was just something I wanted to do and it wasn't really about the running it was about I was picturing the camping in my mind that was more I was thinking well I'll be able to stop on my own for the evening and maybe catch a few trout and grill them over the old camp <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't quite work well it did it worked out like that sometimes obviously I didn't take a fishing rod um, but when you get into it you realize ah this this isn't a picnic you know this isn't a picnic anymore. If I don't really apply myself and, and sort my head out and sort my equipment out, I'm not going to do this. It's just, it's too difficult. And then you really focus. And then suddenly the cooking gear is like, I don't need that shit. You know, I'll, I'll buy stuff in the shops. And, um, but yeah, no, it was, it was, I wasn't trying to be a hero. I was, I set out to raise awareness of, the veteran suicide epidemic that we're facing at the moment and the PTSD and, and this kind of stuff. We raised 18,000 pounds for a, for the Batten charity, which supports, um, supports veterans. I always try to get a little bit of my political commentary <laughs> in there as I'm going. So, um, so yeah, no, I didn't set out to be a hero. I just set out to have a, like a, bit of fun time on my own it just it just turned into an epic and that's wicked man it's wicked yeah well I try and push myself for my 50th birthday that was the next year I did a quadruple Ironman distance triathlon which isn't impressive in itself what is impressive is that eight weeks earlier I came last in my first ever triathlon so I did an Olympic triathlon in Torquay literally came so last that my son was on the finish line going where's my daddy why is everyone finishing my daddy's not finished 40 minutes later I'm, I'm here i'm here son when i went off to do the run the organizers were like could you just stop now so we can all go i'm like no sorry if you if you want my to keep my medal that's fine but i'm not stopping and so coming last in my first triathlon i said right in eight weeks i'm gonna do four iron men <laughs> which was it culminated in a 108 mile non-stop run um, up in Lincolnshire. It was up in Nottingham rather. And yeah, that was a bit legendary. <laughs> so what, so, so what, what distance swimming is that? That was a nine and a half mile swim. Jesus wept. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm going to be honest, Gareth, because I just prefer being honest about stuff. I'm, I think elite athletes tend to actually think they're elite and we're not, we're all just human. And if you can do a half marathon, you can do a hundred miler, right? Okay. You know, the, 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 
I don't want to steal people's dreams is what I'm trying to say. So when you swim in a wetsuit, it's completely different to just diving in the swimming pool where I can swim about two lengths and I start to, you know, I've really had to teach myself to swim, you know? Yeah, I did the, um, I swam to the Isle of Wight. That's about as close as I got. I swam the mainland to the Isle of Wight, but that's nothing like that distance. Did you wear a wetsuit though? I did, yeah, I had to because it was freezing. Because the wetsuit gives you so much more buoyancy than normal swimming. In fact, my triathlon wetsuit, even though the arms are, parts of the arms are like one millimeter to give you the flexibility, but some of it is five mil and the important bit. So it's almost a, like an accepted cheat, a profession. You know, it's well within the rules to wear a wetsuit, obviously for, an, for any kind of Ironman or, or triathlon. But what I'm getting to is it stops you drowning. So all you've got to do is just keep moving your arms and kicking your legs. And if you get tired, yeah, you can roll on your back, have a breather, then then go for it again. Um, and it's funny, yeah, nine and a half miles wasn't, it wasn't massively difficult. I'd just be a liar, Gareth, if, was, if that wasn't the difficult bit. The cycling was hard. So I, I did it. I tried to do it all in seven days. Each cycle, I cycled 100 miles a day. 125 I think on the first day so in four days I'd done 450 miles I think it had to work out to and yeah trying to even on my ultra light fancy bike that I bought that's quite hard to cycle 100 miles in a day um, yeah 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 I can imagine what's it like swimming to the Isle of Wight then you're the second person that's done that I had Daz Hardy on my podcast he's a former um captain in the army and he he swam to the isle of Wight, and then i think he ran around it or something right right no i um i was basically was trying to do these these um challenges to raise money for a kid in derby who, who sadly passed away but it was trying to get him treatment and so what i was doing i was raising all right money don't get me wrong like i, I walked the length of the isle of Wight, it was about 27 miles i did that in my pants just these horrible tidy whitey pants thing and so I was trying to add little things. So I was thinking, walk the Isle of Wight, it's like easy enough. Um, but if I add just the pants in it, then obviously people donate money just for me to look like a prat, basically. So I was doing all these things and I wanted to do these things. I was like, I need to do something. something. So I sent to my, well, now wife, then girlfriend. I was like, I feel like I need to do something that is going to, you know, I'm not very good at swimming. I'm all right at swimming. I grew up on an island, but I'd never put myself down as like a really good swimmer. And I was like, so... If I do that, then that might get more people to donate because they'll be like, oh, Ike's not that good at swimming. And um, and so I did. And it worked. You know, I raised a, f a few grand for that, um, for swimming it. Um, but also it was a real challenge for me. So I was doing like 100, 100 lengths a day every day for like three months before. And that was great. So I just got myself in really good shape. And then um, obviously I had the challenge of doing it. But what I added onto the challenge, which annoyed my, my wife actually, was that I said, if I fail... Because these are the rules, the strict rules with it. So if at any point I grab hold of the boat, which you have to have a boat with you, then that's done. It's finished. It's over. Um, and so I said to every, like every, I was doing a radio show at the time on on the, on the Isle of Wight. I said if if I fail, I'll walk naked down Union Street that night. So it was the middle of August. It was a Saturday night. Town would be heaving. With me walking down with with my pecker out. Like right? you'd never live it down. And I remember like my wife was like, why would you do that? And I was like, because I know I'm going to hit a wall. Like I know I am. And so if I hit that wall and the decision is you carry on going or you have to walk down Union Street tonight with your knob out, I'm going to finish this swim. <laughs> and so that, so that was the idea. I was, I was like, going to challenge myself. But what I didn't then bring into consideration was that, but what if something happens that's beyond my control? And so what happened was one of the big massive um, car ferries started basically coming towards me and I was getting, I was caught on the riptide and I was drifting towards it. And it got to such a point where I was like, I'm going to have to jump in the boat in a minute because otherwise this is going to sweep me up. Thank goodness. I, I managed to sort of just, just get around it enough that I could carry on because that would have, yeah, like I said, I'd, I'd never live that down. Now, I was going to um, say Gareth, it's quite a busy sea lane there, isn't it? As well, it's the busiest in the world. I mean, the, the channel is the busiest in the world full stop. So yeah, that's yeah. even busier. Yeah, even busier because you've got Lymington, you've got Southampton, you've got Portsmouth, all within a stone's throw of each other. Um, 
plus you've got the military, obviously because you've got the Navy in Portsmouth. This is another thing I didn't realise. Like we had to get permission off of six different harbour masters, the MOD, um, the Council of the Isle of Wight, the Council of Hampshire, Hampshire County Council. It was it was ridiculous the amount of of permissions and stuff that you had to get. You had to have a boat with you. Um, you had to do. Um, I can confess this now because it was years ago. You had to do this risk assessment thing. We didn't do it. We just wrote it up and how we'd been practicing pulling me onto the boat. We hadn't because we only had the boat for a day, and um, and all this stuff we had to do. Yeah, the paperwork was was ridiculous actually. To be fair, that was more of a ball lake than the actual swim. Yes, my gosh, how? What's the distance, mate? Sorry, it's about four mile. Ah, that's um, but it, but it depends where you do it. But yeah, it's about it's about four mile on average. But it's it's a tough one because. Because the, the rip tides are so much, like this was another thing I'd aimed. So my family were all at a certain point and I was swimming towards, and I could just see them <laughs> just get further and further away. And I ended up landing, I think it was about best part of 2K away from where they were. And another part of the rule is obviously you have to go on to shore. So as soon as you go on shore, tick the box, you've swam the servant, you go on the list of people that have done it. And I had nowhere to go. And so I was sort of just treading water and there was a pontoon like a little bit further down and the family were out because it was early in the morning because obviously you have to go on the tides. They were sat out having their breakfast and I said to them, I was like shouting out, I was like, can I come on your land? And they were like, yeah, come on up. So they let me on their pontoon so I could tick it off. So that was all right. Because I don't know what I'd have done because my, my, my arms were dead. And if at that point I'd had to turn around and try and swim back another kilometre or something to get onto a beach, I, I think I'd have been, I'd have failed really. But yeah, they let me on. And then, yeah, got in the boat and then sailed back the two kilometres back to where my family were waiting. My yeah. gosh. Oh, well done. That's a great achievement. It's yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not quite yours, but it, it was, you know, it was... Well, yeah. in, in fairness, you did yours in open water, which technically an Ironman is, is usually open water, but I only call mine an Ironman distance triathlon because I did the distances, right? Um. The reason was I couldn't get any skipper of a boat in Plymouth wouldn't. I, I put the word out in our fishing community and they they wouldn't do it because of insurance. Right. In the end, it was like, well, do I want to be swimming around Plymouth Harbour on my own with like a, one of those red floats or something? You know, and, and, and how's that measurable? Where am I swimming from? And what if the tides just change and it complete? So in the end, I went to the Lido pool. So it's a salt water outside cold water pool. And um, they agreed to let me do it there. And then I got uh, I got about four miles into the swim and I'd gone hypothermic. So I was shivering beyond all, all possibility of continuing. If I continue, I was going to die. So then I hopped out into the actual swimming pool that we've got here in the city. <laughs> and I did the... The, the rest of it just just do it just doing lengths in you know obviously in my in my shorts I didn't have the benefit of the wetsuit then but I had the benefit of not dying which kind of yeah well that's a benefit isn't it <laughs> yeah so so no it's all good credit to you mate doing it in open water that's a, yeah it's another thing again um I did my first triathlon in open water and it's yeah you're vulnerable when you're out there right yeah yeah I ended up in the end just going breaststroke I was just like, do you know what? Because it was it was so like the waves and stuff, and I was just like, do you know what? I'm just going to breaststroke this because it because it doesn't matter how long it takes because no. obviously it wasn't a race; it was just to do it. So I was like, it didn't matter. But I, I still did it in about it wasn't that long, about an hour and twenty, mm. something like that. It was a lot less time than I thought it'd be, to be fair. Mm. Um, but yeah, I need another challenge now, so I'll come up with another one. Yeah, just to, just to sure. focus on something. I hate all these virtual things. I don't hate the people's input that, you know, I'm, I'm all for people trying new stuff and taking on chat is great, but I hate the fact that it's all part of the agenda, isn't it? That they're staying indoors and not talking to people and not running with people. And um, Oh yeah. It's all long planned. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember there's a bit the Bill Hitch sketch where he's talking about people just staying in their houses, watching American gladiators well, big trucks were going past and firing pizzas through people's letterboxes and everyone's staying in their house. I mean, that he was telling those gags in about 93, 92, 93. And it's like, do you know what I mean? 
that's what's happening. Like, you know, obviously that's a, a, an exaggeration of the thing, but the fact that people are just staying in. It's not really an exaggeration though, is it? That has been the scenario. You know, people are earning less money, but spending more on takeaway and alcohol. It's just insane to think of the mental health problems we've stored up at the same time our health service has been destroyed from the inside out or the upside down, whatever the hell it is, or the, you know. Oh, yeah. It's not fit for purpose, the NHS. No. No. Um, we, we are going to hit a wall of, of mental health problems. I mean, it, it's... Yeah. You know, can, can you, when furlough ends as well you see they've extended that till september now compliance compliance bribery payments till september it's just to keep people shut up but um but when it does end eventually which it will obviously because it's it's not you know infinite man what is going to happen yeah yeah what was the deal then with your dad and the london real people there's quite a big thing going on there for a while, wasn't there? He was featuring. Yeah. So he'd been on London real a couple of times, like over the years. And then they got him on just before lockdown. I think it was so March, middle of March. And it went viral, like proper viral. So then they had him back in April. They used five as an excuse, but I mean, I've been making five videos for my dad's website for his for his youtube for years um and there was never any problem you know if you spoke about israel you got demonetized if you, some of the climate change stuff you got demonetized but some was all right but the 5g stuff was fine so then all of a sudden it was because of 5g but it, but they'd left the original london real interview on where he talked about five loads but then they took off the second one so that was obviously where they had an issue um and then so, he, yeah, he's done, I think it's five now. He's done five of them. Yeah. I, I'll say now I got a very different view on it all from certainly from the mainstream, because I think health starts with yourself, starts with maintaining an alkaline diet. So your body is p the right pH that nature intended, uh, moderate exercise, and get rid of the stress, you know, which is your mindfulness. Right. And, and, that's done me well for 17 years now. I haven't been ill. Yeah, but that's the thing as well. But like what I said at the start, it's about responsibility. They're taking away responsibility from everyone. So no one's accountable for anything anymore. So it's like the same when people want to, you know, make you wear these in a supermarket and you say to the guy, are you going to be, are you going to be accountable? Are you liable for anything that happens to me as a result of me wearing this? What? What? But exactly. No one wants to take responsibility. And it comes for the same for your own health. So it's like, all of a sudden you're responsible for everyone else's health. I'm responsible for everyone else's health and they're all responsible for mine. So that's since when, like, I don't carry your inhaler for you. What are you talking about? I'm responsible for my own health. You're responsible for your own. The fact that you're obese, have a horrendous diet, um, you know, a, a diabetic as a result of years of horrendous diet, that's on you, mate. That's on you. And so therefore, if you're more susceptible to illness and disease and respiratory problems, then that's again, without sounding callous, which I don't mean to, that's on you, mate. Mm. You know, the fact that if I'm healthy and I exercise and I eat well and, you know, try and relax, like you say, because stress is the big, biggest killer in the world anyway, then that's on me, you know? So, oh God, it's just insane. Even as a fairly well-balanced person now, I mean, I still, yeah, I, I mean, I have mental challenges every single day. It's just the nature of, 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 suffering extreme trauma in your life but even me I'm I struggle with this loss of routine I, I can't hit the sauna and the gym at, at, at six in the morning like I love doing I fucking love it mate you know it, it makes me happy to be me and, and and love the planet and and feel so good about my day and then I come back from that do I want to go to the off license and buy a bit no of course I don't I, I'm not that life is like a history. When you shove me in a house and I'm stuck, you know. Oh, same, same. I was having I was having um, kegs delivered in the first lockdown from the local brewery. Yeah. Do you know what it I mean? affects everything. When my alarm go, well, I didn't even use to set an alarm. Come five o'clock, I hop out of bed. You couldn't stop me. 
I loved it. I just love being the first person up in my street. I love getting two hours of work, four hours of work done, including my, my workout and stuff before everybody else get even gets to the office. Now it's, it's all changed, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, I obviously I'm as strict as I can in my routines, but just to be honest to people, I find it tough. I wake up in the morning. It's like, Oh, I can't go gym. You know, and I'm not like a, I'm not one of these kind of merchants, Gareth. I, I do it for my my mental health. You know, I, I love to have that sauna in the morning. I love to run around the seafront. Just sometimes um, a mile it doesn't have to be far, but just just to get out and get moving. And no, I, I'm, I'm the same. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, well, that's another sign for me that you can't go to the gym, but you can go to McDonald's. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. You, you can't make yourself healthier, but you can make yourself more unhealthy during a, a, a supposed health crisis. It doesn't make any sense. Gav, I just want to finish off. Oh, you've been such a brilliant guest. I'm absolutely made up that you've come on the podcast. It's um, it's just, uh, well, it's like a dream come true for me, really, to, to spend my time talking to bloody legends, you know, the people I want my son to, to look up to. Um. But I do want to give your music a mention. It, it, we were saying, is there any way people can support you? Can they get you on some pay pay channel or whatever? Well, um, all the stuff's on Spotify and iTunes and stuff like that. But I find like, if you just go to garethite.com, I put my all the songs on Bandcamp. And there, you can listen to them there anyway. So it does the same job as Spotify. But if you want to download them, um, say, say now you, you spent a pound on a tune then that just comes to me then. Um, whereas with iTunes, they take obviously a huge cut and they also don't pay you for six months. <laughs> so so all the money can sit in their bank accounts, get an interest for six months. God knows how much they must make off that alone. Um, so that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, the, I think Bandcamp are a relatively small organisation and so it's it's a little bit more organic. For anybody watching, if you want to you know, employ Gareth services, please get in contact with him. You know, if you need a speaker, if you want someone to make sense of what's going, what's going on in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't let you go without saying your speech in London, which was not that long ago, was it was just incredible. Thanks, I mean, mate. Thank I, I you. I heard you on the podcast the night before talking to Rich going, yeah, I'm in London tomorrow. Apparently I've got to speak. I'll just get up and say something that's, and, and you were really good, mate. Really, really the fact you did it without any notes and it was all from the heart. Um, yeah, it was good. Thanks mate. Appreciate that. That was, that was something I wanted to do uh, was, was just to make sure that it wasn't like, you know, some scripted nonsense that off of a bit of paper. It was like, and I'm just going to speak my truth. And because you speak your truth, you, sh you don't, you don't need notes. No, no, you don't. Well, hopefully you, me and Rich can do a, podcast maybe we can do rich's show to all your your and rich's show together and then you know, yeah yeah that'd be a good that'd be a laugh yeah I'd enjoy that a bit more and yes brilliant and give yeah. my love to your dad if you if you would i will of course yeah yeah i'll pass that on definitely and to your and to your family obviously so friends at home massive thank you to gareth this like i said is a, a it's a very great moment on the podcast Massive love to you all and thank you for supporting us. If you can like and subscribe, it's going to hopefully help us to make sense of this uh, insane world and look after yourselves.